This is APCO Forum, powered by APCO Worldwide, an advisory and advocacy communications firm. Now, here's your host, John Deftarius. Hello and welcome to APCO Forum, timely conversations catalyzing progress on global topics. I'm John Deftarius of APCO Worldwide. Uh, the Clyde River is behind me. Beyond that is the venue for COP26, 30,000 delegates attending. Uh, this is week one with 180 countries represented around the negotiating table. A lot of progress so far, but is it enough momentum to carry us over the line to make this a monumental COP26 or not? We have a fantastic panel that's going to be joining us. But first, let's bring in Heather McGeary. She's the global lead of climate and sustainability for APCO Worldwide. And, and Heather, we've had, what, some movement on uh, block and deforestation, uh, $131 trillion for sustainable finance to, to 2050, and a big move on methane emission reduction, something that's going to impact the oil and gas industry and also coal. Uh, how would you rank what we've seen in week one so far, Heather? Well, thanks, John. I think that we are seeing some really important movement around those three areas, as you've mentioned. And in particular, the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use is um, incredibly important. Um, it's to, to end and reverse deforestation by 2030. And $19.2 billion has been promised in public and private funding to um, to work on this effort. And most importantly, I think that it's notable that there's a $1.7 billion that has been carved out for indigenous people. And I think this is um, really in recognition of how we need culture, society, and um, and everyone involved to, to make change here because we've been working on deforestation for a long time and, and it's struggled. Um, and then just on methane, you know, 30% by 2030, we are now covering 60% of GDP. Methane has um, an 85% uh, global warming potential than more than carbon dioxide. It's the most important gas to cut. We make huge strides when we do this. So, um, and we've got 100 countries now behind us on, on the methane piece. And then the on financing the $100 uh, trillion dollars that's been mobilized over the next three decades, Three trillion dollars a year going into um, into climate change and decarbonization, and I think that we're making some real real strides here. Uh, let's talk about coal. There were high expectations, Heather, that we would get something more definitive, but it was actually the United States uh, that was not a major signatory here. It sounds like politics from Washington bleeding into Glasgow. Yeah, unfortunately, I think that we still are holding on to our, our coal. Um, and I think some of what's going on in Congress is, is helping to hold on to that too, particularly um, some of our senators that are um, engaged with coal. And I also think that our supply chains are really reliant on using cheap energy and energy that's not intermittent. And we're seeing also energy crisis um, globally and supply chain crunches globally. And I think that's also fueling the resistance to really effectively end coal. Okay, thanks for that umbrella review there, if you will. Uh, Heather, let's bring in our fantastic panel today, joining us uh, from uh, Glasgow. Gustavo Manrique is the Minister of Environment and Water from Ecuador. Matias Berniger is the Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Sustainability uh, at the German giant uh, Bayer. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining uh, me and Heather in the conversation here. Gustavo, I would imagine this uh, capping of deforestation is probably the one that's going to have the most impact on Ecuador. How do you see it? Well, we're part of... Uh, well, first, thanks for the opportunity of joining this uh, beautiful panel. Uh, we're very happy with the with the advances that the Ecuador have made in in uh, avoiding deforestation. We're part of the Red Plus, that it's a program that uh, we are one of the uh, two only countries that have uh, accomplished payment by results. That means that uh, we have a baseline of measuring the deforestation, and if we accomplish. Uh, some uh, goals, we receive money. That's the, that's uh, why the GFC, the Green Climate Fund, has gave us uh, around $19 million that we reinvest in communities in order for them to, to change or move to bio-entrepreneurs uh, projects that uh, have the certification of uh, uh, any product that they can sell from their community, a, a, a certification that guarantees that that product is free of deforestation. So uh, 
Um, definitely, Ecuador is a leader in, in some practical aspects that we have been doing to, to avoid or to reduce uh, deforestation. Uh, overall, what's the mood there, uh, Minister Manrique? Do you get a sense that the, the momentum's there or are we sleepwalking to the future? I know you're going to go back into negotiations here, but do you feel that sense of urgency where this will be a pivotal meeting when it's all said and done? Well, John, um, I'm very optimistic. Typically, I, I see the half uh, glass full and um, I feel that I see people really uh, committing to, to, to do the change. And I want to um, take advantage of this interview for, for, to share that Ecuador is a very small country, John. Ecuador is a, is a tiny country in terms of demographic or, or area. Uh, we contribute only, only with 0.18% of the global uh, emission, greenhouse emissions, only 0, 0,18. But we are one of the most mega diverse uh, countries in the world. What, what that, that means is that we contribute this tiny in gas, green gas emissions, but we contribute, contribute this big in the ecosystemic services, you know, to have clean water, to have clean air. So Ecuador is very happy to announce that um, we are going to create a new marine reserve in, at the Galapagos Island. We're going to create a new marine reserve of 60,000 square kilometers that will protect our biodiversity, that, that we can could, we could, uh, do science experiments and, and among other things. So we're, once we're back in Ecuador, the president Lasso will sign the decree in which uh, Ecuador will uh, protect that pristine zone of the world. Okay, very good. I'd like to take a step back and bring Matthias in uh, from Bayer and look at the uh, private and public partnerships, which are so crucial here in Glasgow. Matthias, from your view, from the business community, how are we doing in week one? I have to say I've been at a lot of COPs, and uh, week one uh, is one that drives my optimism in the right direction. One of the reasons being is that UN Secretary General uh, basically said to the business community, you are welcome if you make bold commitments to protect the climate. If not, you'd better stay somewhere else. And you see a really uh, a strong groundswell of businesses uh, that are here to uh, continue what already started in Paris and committing to meaningful climate change. Um, Minister Manrique just described Ecuador as a country with like a tiny proportion of the emissions. If you look at Bayer's value chain, so everything we are involved in from cradle to cradle, our emissions are more akin to a country like India. And that gives you a flavor how important the, the industry and their commitment to decarbonization is to make meaningful change happen. You know, uh, Heather and I were at a dinner uh, in the first week of COP26 here in Glasgow. And one stood up and said, if you are from the business community and you have plans that won't launch until the next decade, then don't bother announcing them because it's too late. Is that the view of buyer that this the next two or three years are crucial, Matthias? That's absolutely our view. Um, when you chop down the rainforest, you are not only losing the biodiversity of the forest, you are also losing the rain. And we can see that in soil moisture measurement around the world, including in Latin America. So for us as a company that is invested in agriculture, we need that rainforest, we need the ecosystem to produce the necessary moist for plants to grow. And these are insights that come from IPCC. Um, the hardest job I have this year is to cut bias emissions by 5% whilst growing, and in this case, growing in areas that are very carbon intensive. So uh, it's really about action now and not commitments that are relevant in 2040 or 2025. Yeah, you know, Heather had a comment, uh, uh, Minister, at the beginning about kind of the disappointment around coal. Uh, we don't have China committing to it. We don't have Russia committed. Even the United States didn't commit to it. You're a developing country. Were you expecting a lot more leadership here from the major uh, countries of the world, uh, Minister? Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, John, we have local problems that need global solutions. Let me put an example. Ecuador has a national law that uh, obliges circular economy. Ecuador has a uh, national law 
with uh, that prohibit uh, one single use plastic. Galapagos has a local law that um, um, you, you fight for zero waste. Even though that, that I just mentioned that we are with that public policy, very strong, very firm. John, we receive 85%, 80, 80% of the microplastic that come to our cost are from other countries. Only 1% of the plastic that we collect in our cost from, comes from uh, Galapagos. And, and the rest, around, uh, around 19%, comes from the continent of Ecuador. So it doesn't matter if we create laws in uh, circular economy, in single-use plastic, in, in reducing waste in Galapagos. So that's why I'm telling you, we, we have local problems that need global solutions. So um, we're expecting, yes, uh, and, and what uh, Matias reinforced about my concept, I mean, we just contribute with 0.18% of the gas emissions. But we are one of the 20 most biodiverse countries in the world. What that does mean? That means that we give the service of water. We give the service of biodiversity. We give the service of capturing CO2 and giving back um, oxygen to the world. I, I wanted to get Heather's view because you've attended so many of the, the COP meetings. Uh, how will Glasgow rank against uh, Rio or the Kyoto uh, meeting, or for that matter, Paris, do you think, Heather, in the second week at, when it's all said and done, uh, the boldness you were looking for, or are we just saying we're sleepwalking to disaster? Uh, maybe somewhere in the middle, John. Uh, you know, I think we had Rio, we had Kyoto, and we had Paris, and those were really significant because th th that was really important international um, negotiations being decided. And this COP is about delivering more ambitious, nationally determined contributions. So each country has to um, increase their level of ambition. So I think there is, is less to be decided at this COP. And what has been heartening about this COP is that I think there have been some bold commitments made at the in, intra-country level um, that's not necessarily part of directly part of the UN process. And I think that's really important. And I think that um, I know there's been some criticism for some of the business community coming and flying in on their jets. And at the same time, they're here. And I think the world is actually really focused on climate and knows that we are in an urgent place. So I think going forward, we're in a in a in a decent position to keep moving moving things ahead and trying to achieve the 1.5 degree um, degree goal that we have set for ourselves. And um, lastly, I think that what we're gonna be looking for in two years from now is the global stock take. And so that is really, how are we tracking progress on um, reaching our goals towards 1.5? And I think that uh, that global stock take process has to start now at this COP too. You know, Matthias, I was thinking about it in the context of what I've covered over the last 30 years. And one was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the tumbling of communism. And you know what I'm talking about. But at that time, the leadership was phenomenal in rallying to the cause. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping didn't want to attend, uh, nor did Vladimir Putin. We were expecting more from the United States when it came to coal. Is there a vacuum here, Matthias, in your view? I know it's a delicate question, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I have to say, uh, John, that I think the G7 countries made a mistake when they met earlier this year and basically poked their finger uh, in President Xi's eyes in the way they try to kind of create an anti-China phalanx. You, you cannot expect from a country that has a 5,000 year tradition uh, to then kind of play nicely in the sandbox. China will act on climate out of self-interest. Future droughts jeopardize livelihoods of literally hundreds of millions of people living at China's East Coast. I'm not worried about China. I'm worried about the United States not having a political consensus to drive climate. And I'm worried about Europe not driving innovation as hard as we need to in order to make this happen. But let me start on a good news. Six months ago, a couple of companies came together and said, we want to mobilize $1 billion in order to protect tropical and subtropical rainforests. Within this very short time frame, we made, the, uh, we, we made that goal, we achieved it. And Ecuador is one of the few countries, the minister hinted to it, 
that are amongst the first recipients of real money in return for protecting biodiversity. This is what we need to do. We need to get real here and transfer resources and then hold everybody accountable to do the right thing. Yes, again, we have a local problems that need global solutions. And I beg them to think in their child and their grandchild. Ecuador have launched this uh, new marine reserve created today, not 2030, not 2050. Uh, uh, today, uh, Ecuador signed the pledge to reduce 30% of the methane. Today, uh, Ecuador announced the creation of the first time in the worldwide life uh, we create a corridor that will connect Panama, Costa Rica, Colombia, and Ecuador, even though our, our frontiers doesn't touch. It's, it's the new frontiers, you know. Uh, countries like us have the new currency that the world needs in order to survive. And I'm not talking about the Bitcoin. I'm talking about the biodiversity. That's the new currency the world needs. And we have it as a country, and we're making solutions today. Great. It's nice to have you joined us. I know you have to let you go for your uh, discussions. Uh, Minister Gustavo Manrique of Ecuador joining us in the AFCO Forum. Let's go back to Heather and Matias uh, to get their final thoughts. One of the other big stories of the first week was India and Prime Minister Narendra Modi talking about net zero by 2070 and at the same time says we're going to have 50 percent of our primary energy supply coming from renewables uh, in the not too distant future. But I thought 2070, I don't think I'll unfortunately, be around to see it. Is that too far out, Heather? Yes, John, I think that it is too far out for India to say that 2070, they'll be carbon neutral if we're going to try globally to hit our 1.5 um, goals. And something else that I was noticing about Modi's speech when I was listening to it is that not only is 2070 too far out, and while they do have a commitment to 50% renewables, they're also back on the coal topic. They are continuing to build coal-fired power plants um, with to power the other 50% of their en energy needs. And so um, I think India is hugely important in terms of a global powerhouse and an economy and the world's largest democracy. And we really need India um, with, with global help to, to become more ambitious. We talked about innovations, Matthias, and I'm wondering if it's going to be a, a breakthrough because when I have conversations on the sidelines here, people talk about the carbon budget. And if we don't take action, that budget runs out in about 10 years time. Uh, what do you think is the, the next major innovation we could see from companies like Bayer uh, to solve the most vital issues here, and that is removing carbon? I think uh, of innovations that would, for example, help India to meet uh, more ambitious carbon reduction targets. I believe by the end of this decade, we will have new technology that allows us to replace fertilizer production. Fertilizers are necessary for feeding 40% of the world population but they also entail 4% of all carbon emissions. So uh, if we found an alternative to that, that would be really huge, including for a country like India. Another example is progress and plant breeding that allows us to grow rice on dry land. And the consequence of that is that India's methane emissions will go down quite significantly. I believe that we will use the same technology routes that got us mRNA vaccines that come from a development that I would call bio-revolution to drive some really cool innovation. And I also want to say that this cool innovation is also a source of growth. So um, I'm quite excited about uh, decarbonization because I think uh, we will outperform and outcompete all technologies. I'm not too worried about what happens with a commitment of 2060 or 2065, uh, because I believe by then we have technologies that just compete in the market and will be very successful. Matthias Berniger of Bayer, uh, Heather McGeary of Acro Worldwide, and we want to thank Gustavo Manrique of uh, Ecuador, the Minister of the Environment, uh, joining us here uh, from Glasgow. And we all appreciate your insights on the key issues that we have today. Uh, APCO is hoping that these uh, conversations will help facilitate deeper understanding of the issues that can help organizations provide leadership uh, roles all around the world. Please visit apcoforum.com for further installments of APCO Forum or find the program on APCO social media channels at APCO Worldwide. 
and subscribe to APCO Forum on your favorite podcast platform. Until the next APCO Forum, I'm John Defterias, joining you from Glasgow.